Hi, hi, it's Seth Truger from uh, Gemma Network Open. Welcome back to Gemma Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor. We've got two special guests today. Fred Rivera, I'm the editor of Gemma Network Open. And we've also got an author joining us today for our first paper. We've got Rich Krasuski from the level and prevalence of spin in published cardiovascular RCTs. We report with, with statistically non-significant primary outcomes, a systematic review by Khan et al. So Rich, Dr. Krasuski, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Seth. It's great to be with you today, and Fred, of course, as well. Yeah. So sorry that that title is a bit of a uh, a bit of a mouthful. But basically, how much no. spin? <laughs> how much uh, are authors kind of putting in? You know, potentially misleading words uh, into the RCTs in in cards trials when the primary outcome is non significant, right? Right. That's a good uh, abstraction of that. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is a problem that we struggle with constantly for all studies, and whether they be observational studies or randomized control trials the use of causal language when it really isn't appropriate, or trying to downplay the primary outcomes when they're not significant and focusing on secondary outcomes, or saying things like there's a trend when something is really not statistically significant. In fact, the whole concept of statistical significance is one that's creating a lot of discussion right now. Tell us what you found. Yeah, so it, interestingly, you know, we went into this with really intent to hopefully, hopefully finding less than we found, and we actually found that about two thirds of the articles that we looked at in which there were non-statistically significant results, we found evidence of spin. And that spin was at all various levels of the paper, whether that be the results or that being the, the conclusion or that being the abstract form. So, you know, the, there's various manipulation of the language to make a trial that really uh, there is no statistically significant primary outcome, one that sounds for the reader like there actually is a significant finding. And, and these were good journals, right? These were phenomenal journals. I mean, we chose the six best journals, essentially, and the ones that I think we all aspire to publish in and hope to publish in. And certainly, you know, I hope that us publishing this paper does not <laughs> uh, you jeopardize my chances of publishing in these six journals, because believe me, that's like a, a life goal is obviously to publish in these journals and continually publish in these journals. So, so what's your advice to readers as they go through these articles? Or Yeah, I think it's, a, it's the same thing I tell, I think, any trainee at any level. It's When you read a paper, it's really important to, re to read the actual methods, methodology. I think you learn early on the quickest way through a paper is to avoid the methods altogether because it takes so long to read the methods section. But in fact, that's the most important brunt of the paper. And so you know what the emphasis, how the study was done. And then reading the actual results. I think people have a tendency to read the abstract and then go straight to the conclusion because they want to know what were the you know, primary findings of the study and then how do I apply that to my clinical practice? When the question really needs to be is dig in and say, what was the question the study was trying to answer? And did it actually answer that question? You know, so I think the methodology is so critically important in, in influencing our trainees to go back and read these papers very carefully and not just assuming that what's written in that abstract or what's written in that concluding section is, is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Right. So speaking of methods, uh, just to review a little bit of, of what you guys looked at, it was um, so all of the negative RCTs for primary outcomes from 2015 through 2017 in right. six high impact journals of New England Journal, Lancet, JAMA, uh, European Heart Journal, Circulation and Jack. Um, you found 93 studies, so that's a pretty decent sample size for, for a bunch of journal articles. Especially yes, if you only but it is still a small sample size. Sure. I mean, one of the biggest critiques of our paper would be you're basing this all on 93 papers, but we would argue 93 papers in the best of journals and 93 papers which met all of the criteria that we looked at, which meant everything had to be explicitly stated. So we had to make sure that it truly was you know, a neutral and not a positive result. You know, the primary endpoint was not met, um, and everything had to be stated so we could analyze it for spin. Right, and you know, you bring up an interesting point about reading the methods. When I first started in being an editor about twenty years ago, many journals put the methods in much smaller type, much smaller font than the rest of the the paper, almost as an invitation to skip this part. Part, of it. but in fact that's really an important part of the paper to, um, to read. What, what do you think is the advice for authors? Yeah, I, I think that uh, that's a tough bit of advice because as an author personally, I think that you obviously want to put your paper in a light that you think is most likely to get it published. I think we all struggle with 
getting our information out there. And, and I think so often one of the, the things I, I, in fact, uh, am so upset about was when a fellow or a resident or a student works really hard on a project, gets an abstract accepted, uh, writes a paper and then submits it to one or two journals and then gives up. And that never gets out and never gets properly vetted. Or, you know, I, I tell the fellow, if it's not in print, it's just, it's, it, it's like it never happened, you know? So I think, you know, there is a tendency, and I think we all want to put our studies in the best light we can to get them published and get them published in the best journal that we can. I, so I, it's tough to give advice in that sense because I want to see things get published. But on the other hand, I want to make sure that the things get published get accurately uh, you know, worded so that the message from them is not misconstrued. So I think from the author standpoint, present your results as accurately as you possibly can. Avoid trying to, again, I don't want to keep using the word spin, but avoid trying to spin it away that is, is not really, you know, I, I always tell people when you describe something, you know, imagine how somebody who is a family member or whatever reading your paper who has little to no medical knowledge would walk away with what, what particular message would you want them to know? And I think that's, that to me is when you write a paper, that's how you basically want to phrase it. You want to have that message come out and, and keep the message simple. And I think a comment for both authors and, and listeners or readers is that if you have a randomized controlled trial that's well done, journals are going to be interested in it regardless of if the results are show an effect or don't show an effect. So right. a well done paper, which you know all journals are publishing a lot of, that don't show an effect are really important because they can get rid of potentially useless therapies. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah, it's definitely interesting seeing the last number of years how journals have basically seem to be more uh, apt to take negative trials and that, you know, to try to solve the file drawer problem, right. file drawer problem that, uh, you know, we want to do a better job. Just because a study is negative doesn't mean that there's there aren't interesting findings or that the, the lesson's not there. Right. So right. You know, authors don't, and in some ways, they don't really need to try to spin the paper to make it seem positive when it's not because we're still going to be interested in it as editors. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I also I found it really fascinating the different ways that uh, you, the different types of spin that you found. Um, you know, some were things that weren't surprising, like focusing on statistically significant secondary outcomes or focusing on statistically significant subgroup analyses, um, modifying the population, like doing per protocol instead of intention to treat. These are kind of I think the. Right. Uh, low-hanging fruit shenanigans, um, right. in simple terms. The, one of them I found uh, really interesting was that reporting of statistically non-significant outcome as if the trial were an equivalence trial. So, right. the, you know, and this is when you start getting into the higher level stuff where it's it's not necessarily intuitive, where just because we didn't find a difference doesn't mean we found no difference. Can you talk about the, the different findings you, you got? And yeah, I, I think that was the thing I, I found the most interesting is that there's so many variations in how to spin something. So it really doesn't have to be, I, like you said, I think there's the ones that we classically uh, accept or see, and that is, you know, looking at secondary endpoints. But there, I think there are many different levels at which this can be done. Um, and, you know, for perhaps talking about, hey, this is a safe this is the other thing that we found is, is that this is a safe intervention when, in fact, maybe it's not efficacious whatsoever. You know, the fact that you're, that you're not killing patients, perhaps doing it, if there's no benefit to it, you probably shouldn't be doing it. So I think that th those were the ones that were kind of surprising to us and, you know, and how often that happens. I mean, you know, the, the study is designed to show whether there was a benefit of an intervention. It wasn't designed to, to show whether that intervention necessarily was safe. That was not the primary endpoint. But if you frame it that way, you say, you know, and I, and I would, uh, to step back a second, we once published a, a trial that was just looking at how people looked at alternative therapies. And what we found patients did not take a therapy because they thought it was efficacious, but they thought that it couldn't hurt, you know? And so, right, so this idea that, well, it can't hurt. And so I think the fact that, the, the, that some studies are presented that way that say, hey, you know, we're gonna distract from the fact that this probably doesn't work and just say, hey, it doesn't hurt. I, I don't think that's the right answer, but there are many different ways this can be looked at and, you know, and, you know, this, the shine or whatever on the apple or whatever to make things look good when, in fact, it was a neutral trial. There's no other way to, to really disguise that. So there are a lot of different ways to do this. But and some of them, I think, are, again, are pretty subtle. 
And that one in particular, I found to be pretty subtle because it distracts you. You simply aren't looking at the primary point, end point. You're looking at, you know, something that, that yeah, you walked away saying, yeah, you're right. It, it, it wasn't, it didn't harm people. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and do that thing uh, or, or change my medical strategy or treatment strategy because of this trial. And we also know that, that most studies have a relatively small population. And mm -hmm. so the ability to pick up an adverse effect in a small study just may not be there. Right. But right. when you do post-surveillance um, studies looking at the adverse effects, that's when you really begin to see it. So just because the study says it's not harmful may or may not be true. Right. And, and if so, many, so many studies have things like run-in phases, too, which people don't recognize. Again, it's, again, in the methods, if you look at the methods. But in certain trials, they'll actually give the drug outright, you know, to the, to the population and then only the patients that remained on the drug for a period of time that maintained quote unquote compliance when in fact, what you've probably done is excluded some of those people who had side effects and other complications. So again, reading that method, methodology is very, very important. Right, and if there's no benefit and you're giving a drug that may have any harm, the only thing you can do is expose patients to harm or potential right. harm, so. I agree. That's tricky stuff. Um, so this is great. I also found it was it, it was up to a, it was eleven percent of them actually had the spin even in the title. So yes. that's I mean that's just fascinating. And I think a lot of it comes down to the journals, and we have a responsibility right. to make sure that we're um, you know marshalling and presenting data appropriately and not letting authors get away with this. And right. And as a peer reviewer, I peer review so for so many journals. It's so important as a proper peer reviewer mm -hmm. to have that state to realize we're responsible for that as well. Where many of us have not really had good peer review training. And I think that might be something we want to think about is actually taking the reviewers for some of these journals rather than just picking them out of a hat, sending an email, but actually making sure that they're properly trained and how to vet out some of this information and make sure that it's presented in a proper fashion. And yeah, that's that's a whole nother topic of right. of the you know the peer review and how we basically it's a it's an unpaid and very important though contribution to the scientific literature. All right. Well, we're about out of time for this segment. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us today. Glad to. Uh, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Good to talk Thanks, to you. Thanks, everybody. Great. Uh, so next, we've got another one of the papers from Friday's release, The Association Between Medicare Policy Reforms and Changes in Hospitalized Medicare Beneficiary, Beneficiary Severity of Illness uh, from Dr. Sukul and colleagues. So this is, we all know that um, nowadays part of hospitals' processes is to try to bill for as much as they can. And that entails potentially putting more, down more diagnoses in their bills. And so the question is, does more diagnoses, does it just contribute to the hospital getting more money, or does it in fact accurately reflect the severity of illnesses? Um, and this was a, a study that looked at what happened after um, there was a change in the amount of the number of diagnoses that hospitals were allowed to um, put down in their, their coding. And this um, study looked at the change from in 2011 when it went from nine diagnoses to 24 diagnoses. Now, the outcome that they used as a measure of severity of illness was 30-day readmission rates. And that, you know, may be a problem, right? I mean, the whole issue of 30-day readmission rates is a complicated one sure. that may depend upon, it certainly depends upon severity of illness, but it depends upon a lot of other things as well. So it's economic status, um, their follow-up care, um, the, just the nature of the illnesses, all of those things really affect that. And what they, these hospitals, what this study found is that when the hospitals coded more diagnoses, there really was no better relationship between the diagnosis that they coded and this 30-day readmission rate. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it was a lot of work for really very little predictive gain in the severity of illness. Right. Yeah. And it makes sense why, or it intuitively makes sense, and this is a finding that we've we found in some other in some other settings as well, that because there's a financial incentive here to kind of not not miscode, but to or not miscode or upcode, but to capture all of the different secondary diagnoses. Um, when the hospital 
hospital readmission reduction program came into effect for uh, heart attacks, pneumonia, and CHF exacerbations, um, you know, there's some risk adjustment there. There's some reasons to say these patients are sicker, and I want to describe as accurately as possible how sick they are versus the kind of all-comer population where, you know, it's nice for the care team and for the patient and everybody involved to know how sick these patients are, but there's not, you know, basically there's not dollars behind it. Right. Um, so there's an incentive to make sure that it's charted as well as possible. And I think we've, we've seen similar data with Medicare Advantage, with um, with some of the other uh, advanced advanced payment models as well. Right, and that whole hospital um, remission reduction program is pretty controversial. <laughs> right. Whether it actually does reduce readmissions or whether it where it actually increases mortality. That's a right. whole whole nother question as well. Right, which we're not going to be able to solve today. <laughs> right. But, you know, this, this attempt for hospitals to provide value-based care, it's an important one. Um, but I think that the issue of the number of diagnostic codes you include really doesn't seem to accurately reflect the severity of illness in patients. So that's really the bottom line. Right. And it's a problem. You know, I do a lot of work with injuries. And there's actually some measures of the severity of injuries. It's called the injury severity scale. Now, most other um, medical problems don't have that inherent right. ability to measure severity. We measure severity by how long people stay in the hospital, those kinds of things, or the readmissions. Those are really actually pretty flawed measures of severity mm -hmm. of illness. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at figure one, um, it, the, the findings were split into the targeted diagnosis, so the re readmission reduction program, target diagnosis, I mentioned heart attack, CHF and pneumonia versus the non-target diagnosis. And even though the scale is a little different here, the targeted diagnosis one goes up to from, from one to four and the untargeted goes from one to three. Um, you can even, even with that scale difference, you see a difference here. Um, and that the uh, targeted diagnosis had a total, went from a total of uh, an average of two to about 3.4 um, secondary diagnosis tagged. And the non-target diagnosis went from 1.6 to 2.5. So a smaller increase, stayed on a smaller right. scale. Maybe these are just sicker patients with these target diagnoses, but almost certainly this is just because, because there's a financial incentive to capture as much of the revenue as possible for these patients and capture their diagnoses, um, which is, you know, sounds very stingy, but it's, you know, some of it is where how much money would hospitals be leaving on the table for care they're providing. Right. And, you know, hospitals want to pick up every penny they can. And nowadays with electronic medical records, it's pretty easy to include right. 20 diagnoses rather than nine diagnoses. I mean, that's just a small programming change done once that you can easily, easily do. Right. But you know, the basic bottom line here is that I think that that um, hospitals are kind of putting all this data in without really much gain and predictive ability to, to really say this patient is sicker than that patient. Right. And not surprisingly, um, as you're kind of getting it, they found that hospitals that did increase their, their uh, health information technology, that basically adopted EHRs, also got better at uh, tagging more secondary diagnoses to these sure. patients. Sure, you know, and, and I think that the EHR companies, Epic and Cerner, kind of probably one of the ways they sell their right. software is by saying that you're going to be able to include all these other diagnoses and therefore they get higher reimbursement, which mm. probably is true, but again, whether it actually improves patient care is another issue. Right, right, right. And I think, um, again, I think there, there's, this is a very complex issue. There's, um, you know, I think there's probably only a very small fraction of bad actors here who are, you know, upcoding inappropriately. And most of it is just that at the baseline, you know, 10 years ago, or I guess more than 10 years ago now, before any of these incentives, there really wasn't much incentive to really accurately code everything the patient that described the patient's encounter, and now there is financial incentive to do so. So I think what we're doing is basically finding different situations where patients are getting described more and more completely, and fewer situations without financial incentives where patients are underdescribed. Right. And you know, I, I think that for people who in hospitals who are involved with, with billing and coding, they really tend to look carefully at what's the gain mm -hmm. by changing the number of diagnoses that are included. It's similar to what we just talked about with the other study. You know, <laughs> in some ways, the companies are putting spin on saying like, well, you're going to be able to capture all these other diagnoses. But in fact, does that do any good? Right. And to be to be on the more cynical side of things. Uh, really? You know, okay. <laughs> 
uh, it's it's a lot. You know, a lot of the the benefit here in the in the you know revenue capture uh, is on the hospital side, is on the kind of administra administrative side of the hospital, and it ends up being you know endless inbox alerts for the providers. And you know, you, you hear the the terrible stories of a provider spending more and more time at home responding to you know finishing charts, responding to EHR notifications, things like that. Um, you know, I'm an ER doc, so I'm, I think on the relatively low side of getting um, hit by these, and I still do get some. You right. know, some some uh, I would say, you know, around nuance level of notifications that oh hey did you do this and this did this patient have this and this happen can you ch check this one box and it's you know uh, adding to the thousands of cuts that we get all the time yeah every time I'm on service I get those kinds of emails mm -hmm. and you know people you mentioned this that, that you know forty percent of doctors in the United States supposedly are burned out and the main reason for discontent the number one reason for discontent is electronic health records yeah. and this kind of contributes to that. Yeah. Although people, I, I, I'm I, actually a little less cynical about that or cynical about that stat. I think uh, doctors are quick to prescribe or quick to ascribe their frustration to the EHR. Um, but having, I'm, I'm certainly just old enough to have used some paper charts. Paper charts were great for your own ease of documentation at the bedside or on shift, but were terrible for every other purpose. Right, you can't, you couldn't find what you really need to know about a patient very easily. Right, it was, it was just really terrible. You we know. did a terrible job of just scroll, scrolling right. horrible stuff. I have I, horrible handwriting. I do too, and yeah, you know. and I mean, if you can see my notes on here, um, yeah. So, so it, I, I think that for me, the biggest frustration with the HR is how much unrealized potential there is, and how great they could be, and they're not, and mostly because of kind of, uh, right. I'd say. Uh, very cynical reasons. And we published a couple of articles in Gem Network Open that talks about how EHRs can be made simpler to create better satisfaction among the users of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, back a couple of last points on this paper. Um, if you look at figure two and three, they break down some of the subgroups. Um, and not surprisingly, bigger hospitals got better at uh, ascribing secondary diagnoses. Some of that is probably biased, where bigger hospitals are probably more likely to take care of more complicated patients. Um, but some of it's also bigger hospitals probably have a better, I'd say, a um, administrative and operation. They, they have more resources to, right. to try to and, make these changes. And more incentive. And, and you can see the bottom of figure two that the targeting conditions really did increase a lot more than the untargeted conditions. Right. Um, and uh, same and same thing, figure three shows what I was saying earlier about the, um, the uh, basically meaningful use. So in implementation of EHRs really led to a big increase in the coded diagnosis for targeted conditions, but not for untargeted conditions, which is, you know, exactly what, what anyone would have expected. Right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, no surprises here, but interesting stuff. Um, it's important, and I, I think it really emphasizes the need to develop better measures of, of patient illness severity. Yep. And, and as we've talked about in previous episodes, um, you know, when we – there's probably – I'm still – I still think there's some – worthwhileness to, you know, figuring out how to do paper performance or quality metrics in, in some rigorous way um, and just figuring out how to appropriately judge hospitals so that we're comparing apples to apples and that, you know, city hospitals that are underfunded and have uh, are dealing with patients who have lots of reasons to be sicker and fewer resources should be, you know, shouldn't necessarily be judged against hospitals that have many more resources, patients with more resources um, and have a much easier hill to climb. Well, thanks so, very much for listening today. Oh, wait, we got a few more. Sorry. Oh, we do have Sorry. more. You haven't you been have with more. us in a while. Oh, okay. No, no. I now. thought that we were done. We no, no. More. So okay. the, we're done with the main articles, but now All we're right. just going to do some quick hits on the uh, rest, oh, of, good. rest of the release. Uh, so, uh, of course, these are only two of the many articles we published this Friday. Um, some of the other ones, very quickly, um, naloxone prescriptions among ad insured adults at high risk of opioid overdose. This is a bit sad, um, but basically they looked at patients who had relatively high risk or high dose opioids prescribed and only a very tiny percentage were co-prescribed naloxone. I, I was shocked at the results of this. Yeah. So I think it's like 10 or 15 percent. Oh, was it actually that high? given naloxone prescriptions yeah. when it should be given to everybody. Right. I mean, on the upside, uh, most, uh, most if not all states now have some sort of standing orders or the ability for uh, patients to get these essentially effectively right. over the counter or behind the counter from pharmacies. Um, but as we've talked about before, a lot of pharmacies don't even know that or it's, it's still I, under prescribed. I, I think the pharmacist should be ordered, basically, right. by law to give it to anybody with a high-dose right. prescription or chronic opioid use. Right. You know, I remember when I was in med school, uh, the, the kind of uh, style at the time was to tell trainees, you know, every time you order opioids, you got to order a bowel regimen. And I think we got to move to the point where right. any time you order opioids for outpatients, they get, it's got to come It'd with a bowel regimen and come with an oxone spray. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to my friend and uh, collaborator, Vinny Aurora from University of Chicago, who's a co-author on that paper. Okay. So she does great work. Um, 
Next up, uh, uh, trends among patients with cardiovascular disease referred to, referred to palliative care. And this is, I, I think, an important one too, which, which basically shows that um, cardiovascular patients, like other patients, are just not being referred to palliative care. Right. And in fact, the proportion that are being referred is decreasing. And what's more is that it's decreasing even more among um, non-white patients than white patients. Um, we all know that palliative care is important, but we talked about this the other day, is that the average time that palliative care is actually, and hospice care is actually used, is 29 days before death, yep. when in fact it should be used months before that. Yep. And so this study, I think, is unfortunately bad news because it shows that things have not gotten better. Right. And I think uh, for a lot of us who don't practice in this space that much, uh, we mostly think about palliative or hospice care in patients with end-stage cancer. Um, what I like about this study was they, they talk about the burden of, of uh, basically symptom burden in advanced cardiovascular disease, mostly CHF, and how patients with heart failure, I think it was something like one in four patients who referred to palliative care were bed bound by the time they right. got palliative services. Um, and part of it's also just workforce issues. There's not a lot of palliative care resources out there. So there's a lot, uh, I'm an optimist, there's opportunities for improvement here. Okay. Um, some other things, uh, estimation of uh, percentage of patients uh, with cancer who are eligible for and can respond to checkpoint inhibitor drugs. Um, this one is, uh, I'd say there's good news, bad news. Good news is that since 2011, uh, we've increased the percentage of patients who are eligible for checkpoint inhibitors from 1.5% to 44%. The bad news is that only 12.5% are still estimated to actually respond to these drugs, um, which is great because it's up from 0.14%, but it's still only about one in eight patients who could potentially benefit from these pretty extensive drugs. Yeah, I mean, these, these checkpoint inhibitors, clearly it's a revolution in cancer care. But unfortunately, the actual the reality here is is that the number of patients who are going to actually benefit from these is much smaller than the hype of, out there about them. Right. Um, another unfortunate bad news uh, study is an uh, interesting study from uh, patients in the Brazilian Amazon basin, um, but that. Uh, when mothers had uh, maternal malaria uh, during pregnancy, the head for circumference of the newborns was lower. Uh, so there's an association there that's uh, pro you know almost certainly leads to some deleterious effects. Right, and you know this has enormous implications worldwide. We don't see malaria here in the United States for the most part, but certainly in low-income countries, it's it's very common. And the fact that children born to a mother who's infected during pregnancy will have a smaller head circumference means they have smaller brains. That has obviously long-term implications for those children and for the communities in which they live. Right. Um, and last one to talk about today, uh, more bad news when it comes to opioids. Um, these, these authors did a, uh, a systematic review of different strategies to try to identify patients who are at high risk of opioid addiction and basically found that none of the tools we have are very helpful at this point, which is just too bad. For identifying people yeah. that are at risk for, for, yep, for, for long-term use. use. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 hopefully that will change. The federal government is throwing hundreds of million dollars towards mm -hmm. opioids now, realizing that, you know, with 70,000 people a year dying, we need to do something. And hopefully we'll develop better tools to predict those patients who are at great risk of, of opioid misuse, as well as, frankly, trying not to put these patients in opioids to begin with. Yep, yep, exactly. I think uh, for me, the, um, the most positive thing I can get from this is that watching the pendulum swing in opioid prescribing is that we've just become much more thoughtful and deliberate about how we prescribe opioids for pain. Um, so as we're more responsible overall, um, there's not going to be easy answers in identifying patients at high risk for abuse. So minimizing opioid exposure to patients who don't need it while trying to avoid undertreating pain appropriately um, is going to continue to be a challenge. You know, I'm older than you, obviously, <laughs> and, and I remember when AHRQ and other agencies came out and said, you know, pain is the, the fifth or sixth vital sign that we need to make sure we measure, and that led to this push to treat pain, and, mm -hmm. and that in conjunction with the pharmaceutical companies and distributors led to the opiate epidemic. Yep, and uh, I've said this before on the broadcast, but I'm old enough to have been taught in med school that uh, patients had less than 1% chance of being addicted to opioids after getting treated with them. Um, how clearly, wrong we were. <laughs> how wrong we were and how thin the, I don't even know if we can call it data. <laughs> Any evidence? Um, but I also, I think it's, uh, you know, the, one of the big challenges we have, again, is that we've got both a big opioid epidemic and we still undertreat pain. Um, and we just need better tools, better resources, uh, and continued positive approaches for it. And non-addictive treatments. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so that's what we've got for today. Of course, there are, you can read these studies and more at jamanetworkopen.com. Everything's free and open access.
um, join us or f follow us uh, as usual, usual social channels, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, we're on now. We've got uh, our visual abstracts are on Pinterest, uh, if you like those. Um, and join us. We should be at our standard time next week, which is 1 p.m. Monday uh, Central Time. Um, Mike Berkowitz will be joining me again because Fred will be back in Seattle. Well, thank you very much. And, and just remember, every Friday we publish um, articles. And please go to our website, www.gemanetworkopen.com. My mistake, it's 2 p.m., not 1 p.m. 2 p.m. is Central Time, uh, Monday or Standard Time. 1 p.m. is when I start rereading re the articles, getting ready. <laughs> so sorry about that, but please join us okay. next time. Goodbye. Take care.